So my name is Ernie Meyer. I'm the director of quality uh, in U.S. supply chain. I support a team of three people, and collectively we manage the protein categories here in the U.S. Uh, that service our 14,000 restaurants. So with that, I'd like to tell you a little bit about McDonald's and our storied past, a little bit about our business evolution over the past few years, and then where we see our customers going and how we see them evolving. And some of this information is a little dated, but it's as relevant today as it is uh, as it was when we first really uh, started looking at it. So first, to talk a little bit about McDonald's. Ray Kroc started the company we have over 60 years ago today, and he's been quoted many times. I think there are many quotes as relevant today as they were when he first spoke them. The one on the screen about being a good citizen and having a real sense of community, being involved in the life and spirit of the community you serve, really speaks to the heart of sustainability and also being a good servant to your community. The other one is, I don't know what we'll be selling in 50 years, but I can guarantee you will be selling more of it than anyone else. Both of those are as true today as they were when he first spoke them. So where does the success come from? Um, it really comes from the model that Ray founded from the beginning. The model was the three-legged stool, and it's really uh, fired our decades of growth and success in, the, in McDonald's. So our three-legged stool is the franchisee, our company, and our suppliers. And each one of those legs has to be equally strong to support our business. If any one leg is stronger than the other, we don't have a balanced stool, and we have to look at rebalancing that. So our business model is of collaboration and alignment, and it's very important with that alignment, we wouldn't have accomplished the things we've done over the years. Our suppliers' relationships are built on handshakes. They're truly independent, provide continuity and stability to the system. And what drives those relationships is mutual trust and respect, incentives that challenge and reward, and protocols that drive mutual success. Franchisees, they're independent, entrepreneurial business people, and we help grow small family businesses. Most everyone knows that we're a franchise organization, but most people don't know that over 90% of our 14,000 restaurants in the U.S. are franchised. And they're run by independent businessmen and women who are truly, truly independent. So in a very real sense, we have about 1,800 owner operators that pay my salary and everyone else at McDonald's. And they're the key to our business success. They're the voice of our customer, they're the voice of our restaurant operations, and they, they make that, that transaction happen every day, day in and day out across the counter. We have a saying uh, at McDonald's in Oak Brook, not anymore in Oak Brook, sorry. We moved our office to downtown Chicago to be um, more inclusive and uh, pull more millennials into our organization. And so uh, we have a saying in Chicago um, that it's not real until it's real in the restaurant. The mantra helps us stay grounded and focused and close to our customers. Owner operators, our owner operators are family businesses, husbands, wives, siblings, brothers and sisters, teams join, jointly owning restaurants, and today many second and even third generations are taking over. So these operators, they're committed to the success of their business and they're committed to the success of future generations in the system. So we have 14,000 restaurants in the, in the system, and how much food does it take? What does it take to supply those restaurants? So here's a, um, a summary of our 2015 purchases, um, and this is just a snapshot of, of some of the volumes that it takes to help supply our restaurants. We don't buy anything, or we don't grow anything, we don't make anything here at McDonald's. Uh, we buy everything from a group of first-class suppliers. Um, so, for example, 680 million pounds of beef were purchased in 2015, 170 million dozen eggs, and 36 million pounds of fish, 470 million pounds of chicken. So we have a significant impact on um, agriculture and, and uh, supply chain, and we recognize that, and we realize that with that, great, um, with that comes a great responsibility. So to dive a little, little bit deeper into our beef supply chain, so we have 32 distribution centers across the country, and those are supplied by five beef grinders that are strategically placed, located across the country, um, close to the markets they serve, and our suppliers have been in our supply chain for many years. Some of our suppliers were some of our first suppliers that supplied some of our first restaurants. So over 60 years of, of business relationship. So what does it take to deliver 600 million pounds of beef to the McDonald's restaurants every year? 
We have to, it takes a lot of beef, beef trimming specifically, and it takes a lot of raw materials and a lot of raw material suppliers. We currently have 33 <coughs> suppliers on our approved supply list. In, in the slaughterhouses, um, these packers have met standards from animal welfare, food safety, and we work with our beef grinders to help manage those packers um, from a quality and food safety perspective. So it takes 33 packers, five grinders to help serve 28 million customers a day. And 28 million customers a day um, is a lot of people in 14,000 restaurants. Globally, we serve about 69 million people a day. And they tell us what they think, not only about our food, but they, think, they tell us what they think about our business and how we do business. Um, our customers are evolving and we hear that day in and day out um, very loudly. So approximately every 12 days of business, or every 12 days that our restaurants are open, we serve the population of the United States. So several, several of the panelists kind of touched on this a little bit today, um, earlier. Less than 2% of the population um, currently is involved in animal agriculture. So we have our customers, we're serving 28 million customers a day, the population of the United States every 12 days, and less than 2% of those actually know where their food comes from. So we're faced with customers who want to know about their food, but don't understand where it comes from. And we're criticized by people who are not fully informed about what you do or what we are doing. It's frustrating to be miscast in various campaigns um, against us. Being misunderstood is tough. It's one thing when it's an activist, but it's another thing when it's your customer. Did you know many of our customers do not believe our hamburgers are 100% beef. The myth continues. Um, we have commercials that we've run year in and year out to all beef patties, special sauce, lettuce, cheese. <laughs> but we have customers who believe that we created a company called 100% Beef just so that we can say we serve 100% beef. Um, it's, it's tough. It's tough to stand up in front of people and say, no, it's actually just 100% beef. That's what's in your hamburger. So when we opened our door over 60 years ago, it was a different story. Their beef came from local butchers and buns from local bakers. Potatoes came in and they, they sliced them in the back room and blanched them. They knew their suppliers personally. Our customers and your customers are changing quickly. So how did this happen? Where are we today and where are we going? Um, this is a, a quick summary of, of research that was done by Forrester, published in 2011, um, about the, the age of um, our customers. So if we look at the, the three buckets here, age of manufacturing, age of distribution, and age of information. Age of manufacturing was um, from about 1900 to about 1960. If you owned a factory, you owned the market. Cost of entry to manufacturing, uh, a manufacturing facility was high, but once you build it, you could generate products at a real economical price and sell those to, to the customers without much competition. Companies like Ford, RCA, Whirlpool built convenient, well-priced, mass-produced products, and they ruled the landscape. 1960 to 1990, that changed. In the 60s, globalization of business in retail, with the globalization of business, in retail moved with the population to the suburbs. Deregulation and freer markets um, meant that companies could reduce cost of manufacturing in other countries. And in that model, distribution was the key. Among those companies who took advantage of this were Toyota, P&G, and Walmart. 1990 to 2010 was the information age. So networked computers, information technology helped companies master that information generated from real-time point of sales. So am companies like Amazon, Google, and Comcast ruled that era. And these, these generations are getting smaller and smaller and smaller and faster and faster. Today, we're in the age of the customer. The age of the customer is an empowered customer who knows more about the products, you, more about your products than you do. With online research, mobile web access, an obsession with understanding, or so with online research and mobile web access. So an obsession with understanding and delighting and connecting with customers is the key. Companies like Southwest, Amazon, and American Express are examples of, of corporations who have uh, been successful under that model. So social media is the number one place where customers get information about food. More than print, more than radio, and more than TV. 
Social media is where everyone goes to find out what it is they're going to eat, where they're going to eat, and what's, what's in the food they're eating. So we just talked a little bit about the Forrester research that's out there. That was in 2011. McDonald's did some research in 2007 trying to understand where our customers are going. And it's a little, um, a little embarrassing because um, this was out there and in our organization for quite some time, but we didn't really act on it as fast as we, uh, as fast as we should have. So if you look at this pyramid, moving from the bottom to the top, you know, the, the bottom rung of this is safe, reliable food, right? Quality, safe, expectation, going to a restaurant where you can um, trust, right? As long as you don't get sick. We've moved well past that. Um, customers have gone from fresh to customizable to global flavors and ingredients. Now we're at the peak of the pyramid, and that peak of the pyramid is really about natural and minimally processed, but that just goes that goes further back than just the, the food item that's on the plate. It goes all the way to how the animal was raised, is what people are concerned about and what people are, are looking towards. Everyone believes, our customers believe, not everyone, our customers believe that what goes in their food, what's fed to the animals or given to the animals, also is, is in the food that they eat. So whether we have withdrawal periods and we have the science to back everything, there's still a misconception that's out there that what goes in the animal is, is given or is eaten in the food and do I want to feed that to my family? So I'm going to play this recording from Ray Kroc, or at least attempt to. Um, it talks about our fundamental um, values as a business and they really haven't changed over the years. We've just changed some of the terminology as to how we talk about it. The basis for our entire business is that we are ethical, truthful, and dependable. It takes time to build a reputation. We are not promoters. We are business people with a solid, permanent, constructive, ethical program that will be in style 20 years or 30 years from now, even more so than it is today. It's Ray Kroc in 1957. I think that really speaks to our sustainability um, message that we've been working on over the years, and we're going to talk a little bit about that um, in a few moments. Um, we, we believe at McDonald's in the three E's, the three E's being economic, environmental, and ethical. And to put, to put it another way, we must have a shared supply, drive positive impact, and our customers must trust us. We have a problem with trust. Our customers don't trust us. So, like I said earlier, um, we sell 100% beef hamburger patties and our customers, that's the number one question we get, are they 100% beef? This is uh, some research that was done on net trust in institutions um, across the globe. And if you look at the your left hand side, um, science academia institutions are highly trusted and as you follow that, that graph down to the bottom, uh, you have to go all the way over to the negatives we're the first in the negatives, but we're negative. Um, global companies are some of the least trusted institutions, right next to national governments and the press and the media. So we keep a uh, company there down at the bottom. Um, we, we do not want to be there, and that is not one of our goals, but we have a problem with trust in our customers. Um, number one question I get asked at a, any cocktail party or any party I go to, is what's in your hamburger and what's in your chicken McNuggets? Is it real chicken and is it real beef? I've answered that question a dozen times and I'll get a text from my wife or my kids at least once a week with that same type of question. So, summary, you know, we have, um, we have a lot of work to do here at McDonald's in building trust with our customers. And we've launched many initiatives over the years. Archways to opportunities with our employees and our, with the employees at the restaurants, um, providing um, educational pathways, Ronald McDonald House charities, and in our supply chain, we've launched things such as cage-free eggs, no antibiotics, important, human, important to human medicine in our poultry supply chain, and our 2012 group house pork commitment. So our journey on antimicrobial stewardship, which is why we're here today, has been a long road, and it, there's still a long way to go for us. It started when we prohibited antibiotics for the youth of use of growth promotion in our poultry supply chain in the early 2000s. 
In 2017, we revised our vision for antimicrobial stewardship, which outlines McDonald's visions for the responsible use of antimicrobials in our poultry beef and pork and poultry beef poultry beef and pork supply chains. In the in the VAS or the VAS document, we define our three R's, which are refine, replace, and reduce. For each of these proteins, we all have, or we will, or have released specific policies to address the antimicrobial stewardship. Last year, we released our global policy for poultry, and in the U.S., uh, the year before, we launched No Antibiotics Important to Human Medicine, which allows the preventative use of ionophores in our supply chain, but does not allow the use of other antibiotics in our supply chain. When we develop these policies, we partner with our suppliers, industry, and academia and we're currently working on our beef policy to be released later this year. And then in the upcoming year, we'll work on our pork policy in conjunction with uh, industry, suppliers, and academia. So our new global food vision for food source responsibly, as one of the world's largest food companies, we will use our scale to drive continuous improvement and innovation in responsible sourcing to help realize a food supply where people, animals, and planet thrive. We call this using our scale for good. And we've highlighted a few things there that are of um, top, uh, top um, importance, human rights, promoting the health and welfare of animals, economic viability of farming, addressing climate change, preserving forests, protect water resources, and reducing waste. So we're a global, excuse me, we're a global brand and our customers have to trust and feel good about uh, the food they're eating in our restaurants. Safe food isn't always trusted food. Today, what goes into the food and how the animals are raised is as important as delivering safe food to our customers. Producing safe food in a manner that the consumer will trust is the new reality of the world in which we live, and the customers have to have trust in the restaurant, the retailer, producer, that they will do what is right for their food, uh, for the animals that are raised to produce the food and for the consumer and their families. So with that, I'll open it up for questions. So, yep. so the very first question that came through is, why, why doesn't the customer, one, trust a company like McDonald's, and two, maybe, why doesn't the customer, the consumer, trust animal agriculture? Um, so why doesn't the consumer trust McDonald's? Um, I think our size and scale, people have an inherent distrust of large corporations. Um, and our size is, is used against us from that perspective. How can you sell a cheeseburger for a dollar? You must be doing something wrong. You must be um, putting something into that that hamburger or the bun or whatever, that isn't good, and that's the way you can sell it so cheap. Um, one thing about size and scale, it's, it's a good economical advantage and allows uh, pretty strong purchasing power as well. The second part of that question was? That animal agriculture. Oh, animal agriculture. Customers, consumers, yeah. trust animal agriculture. And it, you know, it's interesting. Um, I think customers do trust the farmer. They trust, uh, they trust the, the person that, that's raising the animals. Um, they don't necessarily trust the companies that are converting those animals from animals to, to food products, to meat, right? And I think that, that, middle, that middle ground is where a lot of this gets lost. Um, again, large corporations are usually involved in that equation, um, as well as, I uh, apologize to the pharmaceutical groups here, but the pharmaceutical groups as well being large organizations. And I think there's a bit of mistrust associated with that um, that we have to overcome and we have to um, show what we're doing and doing better. So thank you, very, very interesting. Um, so I wanted to ask you about, uh, you know, a little bit about traceability and, mm -hmm. and looking at, you know, what Walmart is doing with blockchain. Mm -hmm. Do you think that something like that would be feasible to implement in your in your industry to, in, you know, to increase the trust that the consumer has and more you know, transparency on your product? Yeah, I think blockchain's a, um, a great, interesting technology, and, and there's a couple iterations of that type of technology that, that's out there. Uh, we're definitely looking into that. 
Um, I think it would be great um, at a McDonald's. We, we could do this today if we had everything in a blockchain. But we, you could go into a McDonald's and you could buy a filet of fish. Um, we know where the, the Alaska and Pollock was caught, what boat caught it, when it was caught, and when it was processed. We, could, we have all that information. It's just in separate filing cabinets today. Uh, blockchain would help you tie all that together. So theoretically, you could walk into a McDonald's and order a filet of fish, scan a QR code potentially, um, and see the ship that, uh, that caught your Alaskan Pollock for your filet of fish. So I think it's great technology. I think it will help us provide transparency to our customers. Um, how far back in the supply chain that goes in each one of the different categories is going to be a challenge just based on how industries are set today and, and um, the visibility that we have in there. I've got two questions specific to the supply chain. First of all, can you talk a little bit about uh, your import practices and what standards are assigned to that when you import beef? So we, uh, we only import beef uh, from Australia and New Zealand. Uh, there's managed um, collectively um, by the, the by a group in, in Australia and New Zealand. Um, so they have to maintain and uh, adhere to the same practices that we do here in the US. Um, and so we have a very strict closed um, import cycle. One thing to note, we only use um, frozen beef in our 10 to 1 patties or our, our hamburger and cheeseburger patties uh, that are on the Big Mac. Our fresh beef is all beef that's sourced out of the US and Canada and fresh. That's a perfect segue to the second question. Can you talk a little bit about the decision to move from frozen to fresh and what impact that's had on your logistics and supply chain within the United States? Yeah, so the decision um, so the decision is really around trust uh, with the customer and help, help to build that trust with the customer. It's also about delivering a great experience. Um, just little story, when, when the idea first came about, um, uh, it was just over a couple of years ago, uh, which is pretty quick for McDonald's to move. Um, I was I was pretty um, adamant against it. I was like, what are you talking about improved quality of our burger? Our, our hamburger's fantastic when it's cooked right, um, which is the caveat. So fresh beef in our system allows us to cook, um, cook that hamburger right more often and fresh to order, which we weren't able to do with our frozen beef patties. Um, so while it's virtually the same raw material, right, albeit excluding the imported um, Australian New, New Zealand beef in our fresh patties. Um, same, same formulation, same fat formulation. Um, it's just able, you're able, we're able to cook it when it's ordered and deliver it fresh to the customer, which is a much better eating experience. As far as the complexities in our supply chain, um, yeah, it totally upended everything. And we had to really think about um, how to do things differently. Um, so this came on the heels of, you know, a, previously launching all day breakfast, which was another upending uh, supply chain um, exercise. Um, and our president at the time was said, or our president said, look, don't tell me why you can't do it. Tell me why you can do it or how you can do it. Um, so stop looking for excuses and start looking for answers as to how we can make this work. Um, we were able to do it with our existing suppliers in our supply chain, with our existing distribution channels in our supply chain. Uh, we had to make uh, a lot of modifications, a lot of equipment, um, refrigeration um, at our restaurants and in our distribution centers, um, where we were only built with freezers, right? So imagine moving uh, 680 million pounds out of freezers and moving about a third of that into coolers, right? So that's a lot of, uh, a lot of cooler space we had to build. But we were able to, to pull it off and, and launch um, this past year. Okay, I'm going to ask another question. Any idea of the percentage of your customers who would have an interest in knowing specific location in the ocean relative to fish fillets and how hard are you working on that aspect? I think that sort of ties into the question of traceability earlier. Yeah, so we have, um, so we're marine, marine stewardship certified on our fillet of fish, which means we have to track and trace where, where those uh, fish are caught. Um, all the way through our supply chain, um, all the way to the to the restaurant, to be able to prove and, and use the uh, certification, and that allows us to have that visibility to that. I think customers are interested in knowing that the place where they're buying their food is doing the right thing. 
I think some customers will want to go deeper into that supply chain and want to know maybe the farm or the ship or you know where um, what company you know supplied them. But I think the real um, the real gut feeling for people is I have a choice to make of where I want to go eat. You know, I have a few bucks in my pocket. Um, would I rather go eat somewhere that uh, makes me feel good about what I'm doing and what I'm eating, or would I want to go somewhere that, you know, well, it's it's convenient, it's relatively inexpensive, but I don't really feel good about it? Yeah, I might choose to go to the place I feel good about. So that's really where we're trying to change that conversation um, and tell people more about what's in their what's in our food, um, so they can feel better about what they're eating at McDonald's. On those lines, um, since I'm an ultra veterinarian, I always get that question that you mentioned about your chicken nuggets. Yes. And from France, that say, how can you let your granddaughter eat that piece of crap? Don't you know what's in it and all this? And I try to find it, and I couldn't find it. It's my daughter's. <coughs> okay. I had to end up going to a supplier of McDonald's. I mean, shouldn't you make that information more accessible for transparency it so I don't get this kind of... Questions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So uh, no, that's a great question, um, and it should be on our website, on our nutritional panels, um, on the website, um, and I can definitely take a look at that at break and make sure that we have that there. But, yeah, most, most definitely. A couple of questions that go together. So the first one, uh, how how much? Noise, how much influence does McDonald's get from the likes of PETA, HSUS? How do you deal with that internally and where do you go with that? Um, sign well, yeah, significant. Um, we have an active campaign against McDonald's today um, from uh, the coalition, uh, which includes PETA, Mercy for Animals, um, and I think there's eight other groups that are, that are involved in it. Um, you know, last year we launched our bold moves, what we called our bold moves in poultry. And it was really about um, what are we going to do to improve our poultry supply chain. Antibiotics was one piece of that in the U.S., but we addressed um, enrichments in housing, so perching activities and those types of things. We we we're, we've addressed the slaughter of, of uh, poultry where we're instituting controlled atmosphere stunning across the U.S with our first system that went live in January of this year. Um, we formed a, uh, a council uh, for animal welfare for poultry um, that just held their first meeting to help guide us um, in what steps we need to take and we need to do better. Um, we're also building a key welfare indicator database, so a lot of information is collected at supplier level, but it's all separate in separate locations. We're, we're building a database where our suppliers will upload key welfare indicator metrics, and then we'll be able to track performance, benchmark, and set improvement and target goals um, on those key welfare indicators. So those are some of the things we're doing. The other things that we're looking at, but we're not, we haven't committed to, which is in, in disagreement with the, uh, the coalition, um, is a slower growing breed of chicken and decreased stocking density. And we said in our, our announcement that we're, we'll look at those, we'll study those, and we'll research them, but we're not going to make a commitment at this point in time. And um, that wasn't good enough, so they have an active campaign against us. Um, they regularly visit us in our downtown office probably about once or twice a month uh, with a scary Ronald and a, and a chicken with a broken wing. Um, and then they have an online campaign that uh, has kind of sputtered out a, a little bit. but. Um, Proud of our company, proud of our organization where we've taken a stand and we said, look, we're going to do the right thing. We want to make sure we know what the right thing is before we make a commitment to do it. So the follow-up to that, that that comes right along with this is uh, how, then how do you engage or what's the process to involve producers in that decision-making process through those pressures and coalitions? Whatever? Yeah, so, um, you know, we have... Our, our supply chain is uh, vertically integrated. Um, we have long-standing suppliers in our supply chain that we've worked with um, for, for 30 years, 30 plus years. Um, the, the chicken nuggets, 30 years old, 30 plus years old. So um, these are the same suppliers that have been with us from the beginning. And so we've worked with them and developed with them the things that we should do and how we can, how we can move forward. Um, and with the, with the knowledge that things will evolve over time. 
Um, I will say, you know, um, we did the same with our antibiotics announcement in poultry. No antibiotics important to human medicine, which allows us to, to use ionophores. Um, we've actually seen a reduction in the overall antibiotic use in our poultry supply chain since the implementation of our policy. And I credit that to a couple things. Um, unfortunately, one of those things is the, um, the avian influenza epidemic we had um, sweep, sweep the country a few years ago. That was just prior to us uh, launching our antibiotics um, commitment. Uh, but what that did for us, unknowingly at the time, I think, um, was that helped us strengthen our biosecurity programs at all of our poultry operations, both egg and broiler operations. Um, so with that, we had that, that added benefit, um, as well as focusing on, on the other steps in the, the poultry supply chain. So we're actually using fewer antibiotics today in our poultry supply chain than we were five years ago. A uh, couple of questions in here about um, sort of the, the communication with customers, and especially around nuanced topics like antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. And so can you talk a little bit about those challenges and your communication efforts around yeah. that? Yeah, so it's interesting. Um, you know, we, we had a lot of talk, and I'll, I'll, I'll go back to the poultry announcement that we had, because um, you don't see it when you go into a restaurant, right? You know, you walk in, you order a chicken sandwich or a chicken McNuggets and you don't really see the no antibiotics important to human medicine. What we found was during our research was customers when they're buying food they don't really want to know about it. They don't want to hear about you know anything about the animal's life. They don't want to have to think about you know that as a living animal. They want to enjoy their Big Mac or their, or their chicken McNuggets. So um, our, our communication and marketing group really did extensive research to try to understand how do we communicate our message and how do we talk about it. And people want to do research. They want to find out about where they're eating and what they're eating, but they don't want to have to really think about it too much when they're ordering you know, a double quarter pounder for the most part. So, so it's difficult and it's challenging and we have to keep talking about it, but we're trying to do that via other means, social media, um, in, in VR websites. Other questions? Okay, so last question then. It seems to be the theme here. Talk about the impossible burger. <laughs> there's, there's probably four or five questions that come through right now. So. The impossible yeah, burger. Will McDonald's ever do it? Will McDonald's ever do it? Um, I'll never say never. Um, I've been proven wrong too many times. Um, <laughs> But I'll tell you, you know, Steve Easterbrook, when he came on board and took the helm as CEO, um, you know, his, his mantra was, we will become a modern and progressive burger company. Um, so, and he's really transformed us and challenged us to, to do things and think about things differently and think about things better. Um, I will say, I think there, there will be a segment of the population that, um, well, that will be their, their niche market that they'll want to go to. Um, I don't know if that segment will ever be big enough for um, um, a company like McDonald's to, to service um, just through what it would take to, to be able to do that if, if that ever became financially viable um, alternative meat source. Any other questions? I think um, it was it was mentioned uh, on an earlier panel um, the confusion in the marketplace about how marketing works, um, and we're you know we're very careful um, in how we market our items. And so, in poultry, you know, we do not or have not for many years um, allowed um, antibiotics for growth promotion. Um, and that the conversation gets confusing with the customer is really what what it boils down to. Um, are no antibiotics important to human medicine? Um, that was a challenging internal conversation because marketing and communications was really pushing for the easy conversation, no antibiotics ever. Um, 
and you know our our com our feedback to them is you know we can do anything with time and money but let's look at what's financially viable and what's the best thing for the animals um, and we came down to the best thing for the animals is to allow the use of ionophores um, as a coccidiostat that gives you a better opportunity for a, a more successful life for those for those birds with the reduce overall reduction in use of antibiotics so it, that's not a conversation that you can have with a customer very short and quick um, but it is what we're doing in our supply chain and um, we did get a tremendous amount of credit when we launched our our no antibiotics important to human medicine so much so that we had many news outlets that were actually giving us credit for no antibiotics ever um, when we weren't because they didn't fully understand what we were trying to do there so as we look to launch additional policies in the beef and pork space um, we're not looking towards a, a never ever program in any of those um, proteins but we're looking for the judici judicious responsible use programs um, we're looking for how do we find ways to reduce replace replace uh, refine and reduce the use of antibiotics in those supply chains thank you very much we appreciate it.